to episode 181 of the Cricket Her Weekly. We are in the beautiful city of Durham. We've come down beside the river. Behind us is the posh Radisson Hotel where the teams are staying. In front of us is the Premier Inn where we're staying. They have luxury rooms with gold doorknobs. We have Premier Inn or you can eat breakfast. So I think I know who's got the better of that deal. <laughs> <laughs> Raf, what have we been up to this week? Um. Well, Sid, um, we started off, well, we started off in Reading, because that's where we live. Um, we headed to Derby um, in glorious sunshine, so Darbados. Then we progressed further north um, into Doncaster, and obviously we've wound up in Durham. We were in Doncaster, not for cricket reasons, but actually for football reasons, because I was researching the history of, or am researching the history of the Doncaster Bell. Oh, fun fact, Raph. Quasimodo's favourite football team. He's always banging on about them. The bells, the bells. Apologies to all viewers and listeners for the quality of the jokes, which as you can see, as we record even more episodes of the Cricket Hell Weekly, have not improved. Anyway, England v Sri Lanka Sid has been a very strange week, a very topsy-turvy week, because we've just at Durham watched a, a match that essentially finished in the time it would usually take to complete one innings, finished the whole, the whole match, because England were absolutely dominant in that first ODI against Sri Lanka. But um, you know, three days previously at Derby, they'd had another miserable T20 loss and had therefore lost the series. So um, yeah, what's going on? <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, T20 is a great lever and we've seen the same thing in other parts of the world, right? India have lost some games um, to Bangladesh um, and um, more recently, just this week, we've seen um, South Africa. They've travelled to Pakistan and, you know, they lost all three games in the T20 series and they lost them quite convincingly. They're quite high scoring games. It's not like, you know, they, they got bowled out for like, you know, 40 on some, you know, ran, random pitch. You know, they're, so three good wins for Pakistan, but then it got to the one day match, the first one day match between uh, South Africa and Pakistan and South Africa, absolutely steamroller Pakistan. That's pretty much exactly what we've seen here, isn't it? Um, you know, it's the Sri Lanka um, T20 allows them, you know, to kind of, to, to level themselves up against England a bit. And they took advantage of that. They took advantage of, um, you know, some, some pitches which are helpful to their bowling, some conditions that were helpful to them. Because, you know, one thing we have seen this week, we've seen wonderful conditions, right? It's such a contrast to last year. Yeah. Last year, when the England players were, were playing India in Durham, the Indians were complaining because it was so cold. You know, here it's been beautiful weather. Um, and, it, you know, it's been conducive to the Sri Lankans playing well, it, you know, being able to play to their potential. But when it came to the one day matches, what happened yesterday? Well, basically, Shamari got out early and then, you know, they didn't seem to have the confidence that once Jamari was gone that they could bat for 50 overs and they didn't bat 50 overs. And it was very much a win for England's bowlers, wasn't it, Raf? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really interesting because we did also see three caps yesterday, which is something that you don't see very often um, in any format of cricket. Um, so it was uh, Maya Bouchier and Mahika Gore and um, Lauren, Filer. Lauren Filer, thank you, um, who got their ODI caps yesterday. Um, so I kind of wrote in my Guardian piece, well, England, uh, or John Lewis in particular, is sort of bullishly progressing with this strategy of youth first and isn't backing down in any way. But I'm not, having thought about it, I'm not convinced England had many other options but to do that because it would have been very embarrassing for them to have to turn around and go, no, I'm sorry, people who we've said you can go home and rest, we're actually going to try and recall you. And obviously Sophie Eccleston, um, they can't really do very much about that having just had surgery on her shoulder. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it was kind of a, well, this is the strategy that we've gone with and we're going to have to stick to it, come what may. Um, and obviously now, um, John Lewis has ended the week with getting positive headlines about having had um, two of those players obviously took three wickets apiece. But it did feel a little bit more like um, some of those wickets were Sri Lankans playing a bit recklessly um, rather than necessarily... Um, I, I think maybe perhaps the jury, the jury is still out on those couple of young bowlers, but maybe I'm being unfair to I know you were particularly thought Mahika Gore had a really good day yesterday. I thought Mahika did have a good day, and I, I thought, you know, I mean, it's perhaps a little bit unfair, but I thought Filer was actually a little bit unconvincing, okay. to be honest. And I, think, I, I believe that she, you were in the press conference with her, um, and I believe she admitted that, you know, she doesn't have enough variety yet in her kind of attack. And really, you know, it's very much like, I'll, I'll bang it in, you know, short and, and wide of the stumps. She bowled practically nothing that was sitting in the stumps. So basically, you could have left almost every delivery. And against bat better batters, with that slightly shorter, you know, she's, 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 
trying to, you know, make them feel uncomfortable, make them play the false shot, and it works against those batters. But you know, Beth Mooney's just going to, you know, take four balls. She's four balls. She's going to rock back and just go, yeah, I'm leaving that one. I'm leaving that one. And the, your line strays slightly, and her line is not perfect. And then you know you'll get clattered to the fence for four, and you're going to go for for eight, twelve, and over like that. But I think that, in a way, that's the responsibility of the England coaches now that she seems to be kind of in and around England circles to actually work on that. Because um, as we previously talked about on on previous episodes, actually sometimes all of the chat is well, you bowl fast, and that's all you need to do. And that has very much been a trap that England have fallen into, encouraging some of their young quick bowlers to do. Um, so yeah, she Fyler did say in the presser yesterday. You know, I know that I need to develop more variations and I am working on that. So hopefully they have kind of picked up on that and they're not pursuing this policy of speed above all else. But what about Mahika Gorsid? Yeah, I was really impressed with her actually. You know, I mean, again, she's, she's a little bit of a one-trick pony at the moment, um, or perhaps two tricks really. I mean, she'll, you know, she'll pitch it up. I'm, I'm in total contrast to fight that. Almost every ball that Mahika bowls is hitting the stumps. And the other thing she's doing, she's getting late movement off the pitch. And that's really difficult for the batter to play. Even if you're a top batter, you know, if the ball's pitching and then moving an entire stump, which it was, she got a couple of wickets yesterday. One pitched on middle um, and hit off for when she uh, was uh, with Chamari. So it's moving the same way as Chamari left-hander, so she hit off. Um, and then she had another one uh, pitch on uh, off stumps to the right-hander and then hit middle. And you know, if you can deliver that against the top batters, that makes their life really difficult because it means they've got to play forward. You know, batters in the women's game, you know, like to play back these days. You know, they like to give themselves time to, 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 to kind of evaluate their shots like that. You, you're going to have to play forwards to her because otherwise, you know, you're either going to get an edge and get caught or you're going to get bowled. So, you know, it's a very dangerous weapon and it, it and that does look like something that will persist. Her other delivery that she's got, she'll just bang it in short and it'll go over the top and then she'll get called a wide. That's a bit silly, she needs to cut that out. It's pointless. If she's gonna, you know, if she's gonna go short at people, she needs to actually attack people. You know, and in the women's game, people don't tend to do that. And there's, a, there's you know, a little bit of a taboo around actually trying to bubble at somebody's body, perhaps not unreasonably. You know, but in the men's game, that's what they do, right? They'd go, if I'm gonna bowl short, I'm actually gonna try and hit you. If you're gonna bowl a short, then you gotta go, you gotta go, oh, I'm gonna try and hit you. And, you know, I'm gonna take whatever comes with that and I'm gonna be the person that actually tries to hurt other people, which you know I don't really want to see players doing, or just cut it out. Okay, interesting. Um, I do feel like we need to talk a bit more though about the, the T20 series loss as well. Um, and obviously, huge credit to Sri Lanka, right? Because um, they, they came to England knowing that they were the underdogs and knowing nobody was expecting really very much of them. Um, and they, you know, they just completely defied expectations. Um, but from an England perspective, there's been, a, um, there's been an interesting development in the sense of actually John Lewis having to now come out and really say, um, well, yeah, we did actually notice in the Ashes that England were really poor, poor batting against spin, even though at the time they, it felt like they were kind of trying to brush that under the carpet a bit. I don't really remember anybody particularly saying that, but now it's obviously very much being talked about again. And, and he has now actually said, OK, his, his response to losing that T20 series was to go, it's OK, I'm going to sort everything out. Um, because I am going to take, um, I think he said, five or six players to a batting boot camp, is what it's being labelled in Mumbai, ahead of the Big Bash. I mean, they need to crack on because the players in the Big Bash have got to be head meant to be heading out there fairly soon. Yeah, they need to be catching a flight quite shortly, aren't they? <laughs> um, and obviously, they've still got the, the last two ODIs of this series to go first. So that's... Yeah, hang on, yeah, don't, don't catch a flight too early, guys. <laughs> So that's um, that's coming up quite shortly, apparently. Um, it was obviously the first that we'd heard of it when John Lewis just kind of randomly announced it um, on air to the BBC after the match, but it seems like he's had it in the works for a while, um, since the Ashes and possibly before that, because he knows that this is a major weakness. Um, what do you make of that, Sid, and which players would you like to see going to this boot camp? Well, it certainly is a really interesting development, isn't it? Because, you know, it's, it's not often the coaches will stand up and admit, you know, oh, we've got a fundamental mm. problem here with some of our top players that, mm. that we need to fix. Um, but, you know, if, if you're observing those problems and you think that you can fix them, and I guess the plan is to go to, um, to Mumbai and, you know, you can get some uh, net bowlers from the, from the men's game. The, there'll be plenty of net bowlers they can find that will be able to, you know, get big revolutions on the board. Presumably they'll be using the boys from the, the, you know, the local clubs and teams because, you know, like hand, hand to ball size ratio, especially if they're going to bowl at them with a women's ball, they'll get a lot of revolutions mm -hmm. on the ball with their big 
manly hands. Um, and you know, that, that will really kind of provide an environment in which they can face serious spin and that will allow them to work on that. Players I'd like to see going, well, I'd like to see it as a thing for the future, to be honest. I think that, you know, yes, I mean, other players might have issues. You know, I mean, Tammy Beaumont can generally, is the thought of as a player that can yeah. play a spin. You know, Amy Jones, you know, I remember Amy Jones in a press conference a couple of, couple of years ago admitting to us that she couldn't read Amelia Kerr. You know, yeah. that she was just trying to play it and just trying to hope that she, that she, she was kind of playing the right shot for whichever way it I was mean, turning. to be fair, there aren't that many batters in the world who can read Amelia <laughs> Kerr, hence why she's had so much success anyway. Um, but yeah, so I'd like to see them focus on the, on the younger players. So I'd like to see Bess Heath going. I'd like to see Grace Scrivens going. You know, um, you know, maybe even a couple of the other really younger ones like uh, Rihanna McDonald gabe um, you know, as well as, you know, some of the, I mean, presumably Maya Boucher would go on that, perhaps Alice Capsi as well, because it's all good experience. You can get them experience facing these, facing some bowlers in the nets that really seriously turn it, then that's got to be a positive, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, my concern, though, is that um, John Lewis is just going to take his five most or six most senior batters. Um, it, it just feels like that wouldn't quite be in keeping with his whole thing that he's been banging on about, about how we need to give younger players opportunities. But on the other hand, England coaches don't always do things in the, in the consistent manner that we perhaps might expect them to. So we'll have to see. Um, on a kind of related note, um, we did actually have some questions coming in um, from Anne Glossop on Twitter. Um, about Amy Jones and Heather Knight, who are maybe two of those players who are getting on a little bit, who might, um, who we might think that John Lewis might be thinking about taking to the batting boot camp, um, but we would perhaps like to see him take some players who are younger, who have their whole careers ahead of them. Anyway, Anne Glossop says, how long is Amy Jones going to be the wicketkeeper and how long is Heather Knight going to be the captain? Um, I guess we might think about that specifically in relation to the T20 format, but really interesting questions. And I know there was a particularly interesting tweet, and I can't remember who it was now, that actually said that England's big problem in that T20 series, and kind of more generally, is that um, they sent away their best, their two best senior players, but then we're also carrying two senior players who are undroppable but aren't contributing to the team. And that's Heather Knight, who you can't drop because she's a captain, and Amy Jones, who you can't drop because she's your keeper. And we haven't got a, a reliable backup option at the moment. Um, there isn't really a kind of second in command coming in. Bess Heath has not been given a cap in the T20 series, may well not be given a cap in the ODI series. We think the plan was to play her at Derby. Um, because there were a lot of Diamonds players who came along and were in the crowd and obviously were expecting that, but um, England decided that they were going to, um, in, in their infinite wisdom, that they weren't going to play her because they wanted to try to win the series. Well, that went well, didn't it? Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's interesting questions there for man and, and tough ones for England, I think. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, you know, they have now bitten the bullet and brought Bess Heath into the squad and they've kind of, you know, they've... they've uh, smashed a bottle of oil on her head, they've anointed her, they've gone, you know, you are probably, you know, you're in our thoughts at the moment as our next keeper batter. You know, that, that's not unreasonable. But as I've always said, she needs more games. She did have some games in the 100. Was she great? Was she the best young wicketkeeper in the 100? She definitely wasn't. Rihanna Southby was. But of course, you know, Bess Heath's batting is like on, on, on another level compared to yeah. Rihanna Southby's. Yeah. So England looked like they've made a, made a little bit of a decision there, but you know, Bess Heath you know, needs to be actually given some time and actually ultimately given some game time. And maybe she ends up playing as a batter a bit, you know, in the same way as Amy Jones did. Amy Jones played as a batter for a she long did. time when Sarah Taylor was the keeper for exactly yeah. the same reason that Amy Jones wasn't as good as Sarah Taylor. Amy Jones, you know, the, the bottom line is Amy Jones continues to be the best rookie keeper in the world. She yeah. took five catches yesterday, yeah. uh, one of which was an absolute blinder. Yeah. You know, she'll take stumpings that nobody else can take um, and you know, no one disputes that but you know her batting she's just not contributing mm. regularly enough to really be thought of as a keeper batter and that's that's the difficulty there as for Heather Knight how long is she going to carry on well she obviously thinks she's going to carry on at least until the next World Cup yeah. they've talked a lot about this week about the next World Cup what's interesting for me is they haven't quite said what they mean by the next World Cup <laughs> do they mean the 50 over World Cup that's coming in two and a half years time or do they mean the T20 World Cup that's coming in about a year's time? So that's a little bit unclear, but that's whatever, whichever World Cup it is, Heather Knight clearly thinks that she's going to be captain and obviously John Lewis is going to be coach through that World Cup. I, I would not be surprised if Heather is aiming for another 50 over World Cup in an ideal world and that, 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 that's her goal to try and be captain until that 50 over World Cup. Well, is that beyond that, I mean, well, potentially, th th things go in cycles. We've got um, at the last home 
home World Cup in England, we had one captain who was clinging on desperately and really wanted to make it, and Charlotte Edwards, and then was let go a year ahead. And now we have got another home World Cup, a T20 World Cup this time looming 20, in 2026. 20, that is a that is enormous carrot if you're an England captain currently. Sorry, I interrupted you, Sue. No, no, absolutely. But you know, I, I, the one advantage of, of Heather Knight carrying on is it would potentially, in a year's time, give them time for a proper transition to Grace Scrivens, um, you know, who looks increasingly, you know, with everything that happens. I mean, she's been appointed, now appointed Sunrise as captain, in theory, only till the end of the season. But I mean, clearly, everybody thinks that she's going to be permanently Sunrise as captain yeah. now, one would assume. Um, you know, and you know, she, she's clearly, you know, gradually ascending that ladder, uh, that ladder and at the moment, it looks pretty uncontestable that she will be the next long-term England captain. So if Heather stays around, maybe we can bring Grace into the to the one-day side next summer. Um, you know, the, the the big problem with Grace Scrivens, as we've said I think before, is that her T20 game is probably not ready yet. It's her ODI game that's more ready. We can maybe bring her into the ODI team next summer, make her vice captain there, and then gradually kind of make that transition happen. Yeah, I mean that would be a sensible and logical thing to do. So it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, we've had other interesting news coming in this week from the other side of the world. Um, we know we have many viewers and listeners in Australia um, and you've announced your squad um, against the West Indies. Um, now, obviously, the big conversation was around is Meg Lanning going to be back in the side? Um, we've heard that she isn't um, going to be back in the side and that Alyssa Healy is going to captain. Yeah, this one's interesting, isn't it, Raph? I think that um, you know, Cricket Australia and the coaching staff in particular have made it really clear that they that they believe that uh, Meg Lanning is coming back. And so they're saying, you know, we're just, this is all just a placeholder. Meg definitely will be back, and they've kind of put all their chips on that by saying that Alyssa Healy will be captain, and you know, we're not going to look at any other option. Yeah. You know, Alyssa Healy obviously is not. Australia's next long-term captain because she's already heading towards her mid-30s. Um, you know, and Australia, a bit like England, are, don't, are reluctant to make those decisions. But I think they've really missed the trick here. I think that they definitely could have said, um, you know, that okay, the ODIs they're important. They're, you know, women's international championship points. Alyssa Healy will play those, but she's still coming. But they could have gone. She's still coming back from injury, so we're going to rest Alyssa for the T20s and give Tally McGrath the op the opportunity to lead the side in the T20 mm -hmm. series. Um, and you know that, that would have allowed them to actually assess how Tally McGrath does in you know in a big international series, and you know, they've missed that opportunity. They've deliberately not taken it, and I think that that might long term prove to be a mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, well, what do you think about the May Lanning's future? I mean, she, we have heard this this week that she has played a game, right, Raf? Yes, she's been training back with Victoria, um, and she has been been playing now um, for Victoria. Um, so in kind of domestic cricket and I think it's, it's very interesting because um, actually what we heard a couple of weeks ago there was a there was an interview with Alyssa Healy where she basically said I expect to see Meg Lanning back very soon um, but it feels like Cricket Australia are trying to say no um, you know whatever was wrong with you um, which obviously they're still not prepared to say is clearly a very serious long-term issue that you can't come back from um, quickly and that we want to make sure that you are actually ready to come back to, um, to international cricket which is a completely different ball game still from um, state cricket isn't it in the, in the sense of um, there being all of those um, increased pressures that come with international all that cricket. media circus yeah. all that being away yeah. from home if, she, if she's you know playing for Victoria she can obviously you know, be at home most of the time and so yeah, it's definitely a different world. Yeah, but you you just get the sense that um, I I don't have I don't have any inside information about this, but there's a little bit of a thing going on where Meg Lanning is like, I really want to come back in cricket Australia. Like we really want you to come back, but we all need to make sure that we do it in a way that's good, like that that's the best for your um, for your health, uh, both physical and mental. Um, and that's really important. So I, I think, you know, I, I like the way that they're handling this. Um, but I think we have to accept that we are always going to get, you know, that Cricket Australia are always going to get questioned about this. Um, and there are always going to be conversations around this because Meg Lanning is and has been such a kind of wonderful, important player for Australia. And so this is always going to be a talking point. Um, and perhaps, you know, in an ideal world, it would be nice for her just to be able to return quietly with no fuss. But that's, it's a difficult thing to expect given where we are 
with women's cricket, which generally is a position that is, you know we're quite lucky to be in, and we um, feel fortunate that there is all this interest now. Um, but actually, yeah, if this had happened a few years ago, she might have been able to make that quiet return. But as it is, there are big conversations around it, and of course still probably ongoing question marks a little bit over Alyssa Healy's captaincy as there were during the Ashes um, and you know ultimately this is in a very similar side to the one that did contest the Ashes and I've seen actually Cricket Australia taking a little bit of flat for that because they're not they don't they don't seem to have accepted that the Ashes didn't perhaps go as well as um, as uh, everybody thought it would. Well, there's a little, little bit of a narrative going on with Australia going well yeah if, if we had Meg of course we'd have won the measles yes. and it's like well yeah yeah, anyway, um, it actually just feels a long time ago, see, given that England have just lost this, a T20 series to Australia. Um, another bit of news that's come in this week, actually, um, about um, the, in relation to New Zealand, um, where the um, England side are, of course, touring there in March next year, I think it is. Um, so uh, the back end of our winter. Um, very interesting as well, though, that they've announced that there's going to be an England A team who are also touring there kind of concurrently and they're going to play in three T20s and three 50 over games. Yeah, that's fantastic news, isn't it? I mean, especially coming out of New Zealand who've um, been reluctant to kind of spend money on stuff. They've been yeah. reluctant to get involved in test cricket. We, we understand basically for financial reasons, yeah. but they've obviously decided that, you know, in order to kind of build for their futures that they need to give their younger players some more experience. So, you know, we're going to get, you know, a full blown A tour and it's a fantastic opportunity for everybody involved. It's also presumably another fantastic, I'm going to say the G word again, it's another fantastic opportunity for Grace Scrivens to, to, to lead that, that England A team as you assume that she will um, and, you know, get some experience catching me again in, you know, uh, a, an environment that's you know, going to be more competitive than regional cricket, mm -hmm. hopefully, but, not, you know, isn't quite the step up to England yeah. yet. So I think yeah. it's fantastic news. Uh, the only other interesting thing is that the, the New Zealand cricket announced it. I haven't heard anything about this at all from the ECB. No. So there was an announcement and a press release from New Zealand. ECB have given it nothing. I'm not sure yeah. why that is because it seems like great news it's to weird. me, but yeah. hey-ho. Yeah. I've done a lot of shrugging this episode. We have to <laughs> say, when you say hey-ho on a women's cricket episode, you have to then say hey-ho, Flint. I'm afraid that's the law. Well, hey-ho, let's go. Hey-ho, let's go. Anyway, uh, so one more thing this week. And it's kind of the biggie, really, because, you know, um, Raph Nicholson um, has had a big story in The Guardian, a huge story, an enormous story, a story that The Guardian called an exclusive. Tell us all about it, Raph Nicholson. Thanks very much. Yeah, it has blown up a little bit this week. I've been on TMS in the innings break and on Women's Hour on Thursday. Um, and it's been, um, yeah, it has been a big story. So just in case anyone isn't familiar, um, the women, the umpires in the women's hundred were paid um, three times less than the umpires in the men's hundred is the key headline story. Then digging a little bit further underneath that, um, the match fees for an umpire um, in the 50 over domestic Rachel Hayhoe Flint women's competition are £80. So you stand out there for what, six and a half, seven hours, plus your travel time, plus you'll have to get to the match early if you're the umpire and you don't leave for another hour after the game finishes, you get £80 for all of that. Um, there's also obviously an enormous discrepancy between the contractual situation of umpires in elite men's cricket and umpires in elite women's cricket, um, whereby the umpires in elite men's cricket are full-time employees um, and they get paid in, in the region of £40,000 a year. That's not including all of the match fees that they earn. Um, the women's umpires are on part-time retainer contracts um, and they're actually just contracted just for, um, a, a, the, just for the season. They're having to juggle it therefore with, um, with other employment or, or with study um, and, and then that has a knock-on effect on um, their kind of well-being I guess because they're having to juggle everything and are tired and, and a number of them are actually now, as I understand it based on people I've spoken to, are wondering whether they're going to actually be able to stay in umpiring. The ECB's response um, was to issue a statement which said we are committed to um, increasing the pipeline of women umpires, ignoring the issues and ignoring the fact that a lot of women umpires are going, well hang on a minute, we don't know if we can continue in this. Um, the ECB also said, oh we commit to increasing um, women umpire pay ahead of the 2024 season. Well that's lovely, but um, ahead of the 2023 season a group of women umpires went to the ECB and said, please can you increase our pay? And the ECB's response seems to have been to cut the retainer contracts in half. So none of that is um, actually consistent with what they've said about wanting more women umpires and um, committing to increased pay. So yeah, it, it's been, um, I'm really pleased that um, I've been able to bring this story to light. Uh, I feel like 
um, you know, a lot of people are, are thanking me, but actually we should be thanking the people who spoke to me who actually did um, bring this to my attention because I feel actually as a journalist that, you know, we turn up and we think about the players and we talk a lot about player pay and we don't often think about the umpires. Um, and they're so important. We can't have cricket without umpires. Um, and of course, if the umpires are, um, you know, see the umpires in women's cricket are disproportionately women and the umpires in men's cricket are disproportionately men. So there's definitely a, um, a kind of gender pay gap situation that we've got here um, that the ECB have effectively created. And, um, you know, it's, it's very disappointing. But yeah, I just want to say thanks to the people who spoke to me. Obviously did it on condition of anonymity because there's, there's fears about rocking the boat. And I think that, that we can all relate to that across this world of women's cricket. Um, you know, people do worry about speaking up because it's a small world and because um, they think that there might be negative repercussions. I hope that um, there are positive repercussions that come out of this story and that the ECB are embarrassed and that they do feel pressure um, and we've got to keep the pressure on them um, that, that to actually do something about this and change the situation because it's not fair at the moment. Um, I can't think of any justification for why you would pay an umpire um, and you know, a women's match that literally happens on the same day at the same ground with the same, um, you know, it's, it's on TV, it's got DRS, um, it's the same playing conditions. Why on earth is it justifiable to pay the women umpires a third less than the men umpires? I just, it's just flabbergasting, especially in a competition where um, they, the ECB bang on about, it's about gender parity. Well, it clearly isn't um, when it comes to the umpiring anyway. So gosh, I've spoken for quite a long time, but um, yeah, those are, that, that's what's happened this week and um, let's hope that the ECB responds. Yeah, an important thing to speak out about. So, Great. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in and we will see you in a week's time, by which point England will have wrapped up their ODI series against Sri Lanka one way or the other. See you then. Bye.